Hey everybody, welcome. This is RJ Moeller coming to you from the uh, free state of Tennessee, Franklin, Tennessee, to be precise. We're so glad that you are joining us. We're here to discuss our project, Live Not By Lies, based on the New York Times book by our, uh, uh, Rod Dreher. And you, if you joined us last week, you got to hear a little bit about the project. If you weren't here, we're going to, don't worry, we're going to catch you up. We're going to talk through what we're up to, why we're up to it. Uh, I am the producer of the project. And for those of you who don't know, a producer is, could be many things, but I'll just explain a little bit about me and what I do and how this project came about uh, very briefly. But in, in my instance, a lot of what I do is look for interesting stories, look for uh, great books, timely subject matter, podcasts, uh, scripts. It could be anything that I think should be, should be turned into a film or TV series, or in this case, a documentary series. So I read Rod's book a few years ago and was moved by it as hundreds of thousands around the world have been. And the examination of totalitarianism and folks that have uh, lived under and survived things like uh, Russian communism in the 20th century and the warnings they have for us today in our modern world, especially in the West, for um, where things might be going, things that they saw, that they observed, cultural trends, intellectual trends, religious trends, etc. So I read the book. Uh, me and some folks on my team, we reached out to Rod. We met, we got the rights to the book, we put together a project, we, we brought aboard my friend Isaiah Smallman, who I'll be bringing in here in a minute. He's our director, and he can tell you more about what that entails. But yeah, producers are the people that help take ideas from conception all, you know, through fruition to the end, to, to getting to see it made and have other people enjoy it, hopefully learn something from it. Um, I am based here in Franklin, Tennessee. As I said, I spent 10 years out in Los Angeles, grew up in Chicago. But I love storytelling. Uh, I am a person of faith, so stories like this mean something to me. Although we, as we talked about last week, we hope, uh, I, I think I even said it, like I want Bill Maher to watch this film. I want uh, Joe Rogan. I want people uh, to hear its message and the warnings of what totalitarianism actually is like and how different versions of it can infiltrate even societies like ours. So tonight, uh, we're so glad you're here. Um, and I'm in a second here, I'm going to bring our director, Isaiah, in. Uh, our friend Rod uh, is live again from Budapest, from Hungary, and he's going to join us a little bit later. We'll do some Q&A. We'll talk about where the project stands currently, things that we're working on behind the scenes, so that if we are lucky enough to get fully funded and, and partner with folks like, like yourselves uh, to make this thing, what that, what that looks like and what goes on to, to pull a project like this uh, what we hope will be a six episode documentary series. That's that's our goal uh, and why we're doing all of this because it's such a big story, it's such a big canvas to paint on that we wanna have enough time and room that you know a 90 minute documentary just can't contain. So that's our goal and that's why we're here and thank you. Um, so I wanna give a big exciting update on where our project stands um, based on the expressed interest page. But before I do that, I want to bring in my good friend, our director, Isaiah Smallman, coming to us from Chattanooga, Tennessee. What's up? Hello. Can I steal your Can I steal your thunder and give the update? We passed a million dollars of expressed interest today. I'm just going to jump in and take take that big announcement. I'm sure a lot of people. Yeah, why don't you that, take that more? Was big, that was a big milestone. Yeah, take explain. Just do a, unpack it for one sec. What is it? What is the express interest page? What are people actually doing? And what does this mean for the life of the project? Where do we where do we stand? Yeah, absolutely. So we set out with Angel to um, figure out how much people really want to see this thing happen. Um, launching one of these projects is a big un endeavor. There's a lot of um, costs associated with it. Uh, and so their process, which we're really excited to be able to kind of fold into is begins with an express interest period of time where we put the project out there we do a couple of these live streams we talk with all of you guys and um yeah there you can see 2500 people have said i want to invest in this project i want to see it happen i'm willing to put money behind that to make it happen because i know it's not going to happen 
without financial support. And so that is super exciting for us. 2,500 people have said, I want this to happen. We are really excited. We're well on our way to getting to the point where we can launch the live round, which is when we will actually start asking people to invest. And, and again, we can't say exactly when that will be yet, but we're really making great progress. So that's exciting stuff. Very exciting. And uh, to do that again, if you want to join, if you haven't already expressed interest, please go to angel.com slash live, as in live not by lies. And so as I was sharing a little bit, Isaiah, you know, what a producer is, what I do, finding a story, assembling a team, finding ways to pay for that team to get to go make it, thinking through strategies of how you release it, who's going to watch it, all that good stuff. You're a director uh, and there's many types of producers, but director, you you have a pretty specific role and it's a big role with lots of facets to it. But give a give the people a little rundown of what it means to be a director. What is what does your day job look like? Most of the time I sit in a chair and I yell at people from across the room and I say, move that over there. And there's not much of that actually happening. A lot of what I do as a director is I say, here's the vision. You know, it's kind of like being, a, it, it, it producers are a different type of general in a way, but it's, it's, it's sort of saying here, I'm, I'm in general, we've got, you know, a big crew, a uh, documentary tend to be a little smaller than, than feature films and, and narrative things, but there's all these different people with all these different jobs. They're all specialists and the director's job. There's me on set with one of the features I've directed. Um, the director's job, like what I'm doing right now is to talk to the director of photography, for example, as one department head and say, um, here's what I want it to look like. What do we have? What kind of time do we have here? I'm directing some actors and trying to explain, you know, what's called blocking, which is, um, where they're going to stand and what they're going to be doing. And, um, this is, you know, that's me sitting there and yelling at people from across the room, looking at a monitor. Anyway, you get the idea. So um, basically my job is to say, we're gonna, you know, actually Sands of Iwo Jima is a great example. Um, you know, the, at some point we gotta say, we're taking that island, baby, let's go. How are we gonna do it? Whose job, who's gonna take this beach? Who's coming at it from this angle? Who's storming the big hill at the end? You know, the director's job is to say, here's how we're gonna approach it, here's the vision keep it all together throughout the various ups and downs of the project and kind of make sure that it becomes this cohesive whole at the end of it. Yeah. I was watching, uh, rewatching Moneyball the other night, one of my favorite films and I'm a big baseball fan and I don't know exact analogies, but it's like we, the producers are a little bit more of uh, maybe the Billy Bean, the, the general manager. You're more something between a coach and one of the leaders on the field and then the actors or other, you know, there's other roles. But anyway, we just, you know, I get asked that stuff all the time. So I thought it would be fun for us to take a minute and, and talk through some of what that means, because it is it's fun. What we get to do is so much fun. And even though even though we're going to get into some pretty serious subject matter, for those of you who have yeah. read Rod's book or know anything about the history of the last you know years in totalitarian states it's awful and it's it's so much worse than even those of us who have read and we're, we're working on it I, every day we're doing research where you know rod is sharing anecdotes and stories and you're review, you're going back through the book itself and you're and you just say man what a what a heavy subject matter what a, a big responsibility we feel um but also I love it more than anything. So it's a weird, you know, it's, it's, it's like, uh, it could be depressing on one hand. And I guess if you wallow in it too much or, but, but I don't know, we have hope, uh, in the things that we believe and we believe these stories need to be told. And so, uh, that's why we're so excited to be working with Isaiah and of course, Rod, who, uh, will join us here in a couple of minutes. But, um, before we get into some of we want to share some stories, we want to talk about what totalitarianism and communism really meant on this bigger global level and then even some specific anecdotes of of folks that rod is personally you know friends with and covered in the book but also again just sort of that like giving a peek under the hood a little peek behind the curtain of how things are made isaiah what i've got a couple of thoughts but it, where are we at and, and again we want to be clear we're still trying to gauge interest which clearly there's a lot of it uh, we want to head towards eventually being able to crowdfund and raise the money, actual money to make this thing. But we can't wait till all of that's done to start having creative conversations, obviously, and 
and even sort of pre-production and getting things ready? What, what does some of that entail, uh, Isaiah, for, for you and for us? Absolutely. So part of what we've been doing right now is, in, and this began even before we really launched any of this, is saying, what is this going to be? What's the vision? How do we bring this book to life? Um, even in a documentary, you can't just take a book and say, now it's a movie, you know, let's go shoot all the same stuff. It, it, it's going to have to be its own unique experience, which is very much kind of the fun part of all of this is that we're going to start with the book. The book is great source material, but we have an opportunity to go even past what the book was able to do and capture a lot of this visually. So part of what we're doing is saying, how do we do that? How do we want to format it? Which stories do we want to focus on? How do we tie those stories to our contemporary time um, and, and the issues that we're dealing with? And so all of that is kind of what we're working on now. But, you know, we're confident that this is going to work um, in terms of, you know, we, we think we're, this is going to happen soon, you know, because people are showing so much interest. And so we've already begun having conversations with people who head up various departments. And so that could be editors, the directors of photography, different people who sort of manage their own little teams. Um, we call those department heads. We've been uh, having those conversations and just trying to put the people in place so that as soon as we're ready with funding, we can hit the road and go start talking to these people in Europe. Yeah, so angel.com slash live is where you can go, continue to express interest. We, 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 we want to hear from you. And actually right now during this broadcast, we wanna hear from you. So please, uh, if you're joined, joining us in the chat, uh, throw some questions out. We'll get to Q&A a little bit later. But um, please continue, you know, if, if you want to know how you can help us beyond expressing interest, as I'm sure many of you already have, uh, share it with 10 friends, post it on Facebook, share it with people at, at your church, in your Bible study, at the gym, whatever, and let them know. Because the word of mouth of, of stories like this, and Rod can talk about it when he joins us too, and he might even mention it last week, but his book, was was largely you know ignored by the mainstream press and even a lot of conservative media outlets because it's it's about communism it's about totalitarianism it's heavy heavy subject matter and it's like oh geez is anyone going to care and it's become a New York Times bestseller and hundreds of thousands of copies translated in different languages people dare and that's why we're here so um, yeah we want to get to some other things we want to uh, bring Rod in here uh, in a second. But I guess the last thing before diving in, Isaiah, is there any thoughts you want to share personally? I have a, a quick thing and I'll go after you do, but um, just remind people, what, why are we doing this? What does this story mean to you? You know, I, I, I won't start from childhood and the books my father read to me as a child, you know, that sort of stuff, but just what is it? Why does this matter now? What are we doing here? What's really motivating us to tell this? Yeah, I, a lot of it comes to, and again, I think Rod can speak to this really well too. A lot of this comes down to the fact that anywhere from 80 to 200 million people died because of communism in the last, you know, hundred and so years. That's just an absolutely unbelievably, num unbelievably huge number of people. And, and yeah, people just don't really talk about it. We talk about all sorts of other things and um, other, uh, you know, even within kind of the same historical period, there are lots of well-known, well-documented um, tragedies and atrocities. And yet it seems like most people have no idea the scope of this. And the craziest thing is it's still going. I mean, the, there's a lot, a lot of people still in the world, still living under totalitarian communist regimes. And, you know, and, and I saw Oppenheimer last night and it was just a great, great reminder that Cold War is not over. You know, we're still in the middle of this thing in a way. And I think all of that just makes this highly relevant on a global stage. And and it's time to really dig into this in a bigger way as the West. Yeah, I, you, you said it very well. I, the only thing I will add is for my whole life, and I don't really know why, I've thought about it a lot and I don't have a great answer. Russian history in particular, but really world history and stories of oppression have just fascinated me. Maybe it's because I've always known how lucky uh, to be a born in America I was born uh, in that country, in this country. But um, the fact that you, you hit it, you know, th there's a museum, uh, the Victims of Communism Museum, uh, and on their site, they talk about no less than 100 million people disappeared, were murdered in the name of this ideology and this mindset uh, that has gripped so many nations in, in the last century or so. So, so yeah, that for me, 
it has to be told. And so Rod, let's bring Rod Dreher in. He's been waiting. He's in Budapest. It's like three in the morning. Rod, are you there? I'm here. Can you, can you guys hear me? Loud, Rod. loud and clear, my friend. It's great to see oh, you. Great, great. Well, so thank you so much for. Sorry, sorry. We're doing the Go thing, the, the time lapse thing. We're so glad you're here. You've been hearing some of our discussion already. And you touched, you touched upon it last week before we get into some things. And I know you want to share some stories of, of folks that you met in, in writing the book. But remind the people why you wrote this. What does this mean to you? Why are, why are we really here? Why does this matter today? Well, uh, RJ, you said earlier that people, the mainstream media, did not touch this book because the subject matter was too heavy. That may be part of it, but I think the real reason is because the people uh, who came to the United States and to Western Europe to escape communism, uh, they are, and this is the reason I wrote the book, they're saying that they're seeing the same things that they ran away from decades ago starting to reemerge in the West where we are now. Now, it's not Stalinism 2.0. There are no gulags. There are no bread lines, at least not yet. But what they were seeing is the same mentality that they had run away from, the idea that all of society has to be run by only one ideology. And if you, uh, if you dissent from this ideology, then you're going to be crushed. Uh, specifically, the things they're seeing are what we call wokeness, the idea where, where you have to conform to one particular ideology when it has to do with race, with gender identity, with sexuality. Those are the main parts, but not, not all of it. And uh, it scares them to death because they thought they were done with this. The Cold War is over, we beat communism. And look, something like communism, not communism, but like communism is rising again in the West. They're trying to sound the alarm, but of course the media don't wanna ha have anything to do with this because it condemns these people, these witnesses to history condemn what progressives in America and Western Europe say we need today, what accounts for progress and liberation from all our prejudices, that is exactly what the communists said back in their day. These people are trying to wake us up. And you know, RJ, or just earlier tonight here in Budapest, I had dinner with Pastor Andrew Brunson and his wife, Noreen. Now, our, uh, our viewers tonight may know Pastor Brunson. He was a missionary in Turkey who was imprisoned by the Turks for uh, a long time for preaching the gospel in Turkey. Uh, President Trump and uh, Secretary Mike Pompeo got him out. So this is a man who knows what it means to suffer for the faith. He's been living back in the US and he told me tonight that he has been traveling a lot trying to wake the American church up to what's coming. Uh, he said that the American church by and large just can't even imagine it, doesn't want to think about it. They're now starting to see with what's happening, uh, broadly speaking, in American society, they're beginning to see that we might be on the verge of something really bad. But he said, they are all saying that we just know God's going to send us revival. God's going to send us revival. Well, we all hope God does do that. But Pastor Brunson was saying what they struggled, American Christians struggle to deal with, is the idea that revival might come amid persecution. This is something that Christians throughout history and even today throughout most of the world, they well know this. They see this. They see that to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ uh, usually means suffering. But we in the West have been so blessed uh, by religious liberty, by having it easy, that we don't want to think about it. Pastor Brunson saying, that, I told him we were, I was going to be doing this, uh, this uh, live stream tonight. He's excited about this movie because he said, we don't have time. We have got to wake people up while there is still time. So I'm thrilled to be doing this with Angel Studios because, you know, I used to be a film critic at the New York Post and elsewhere. And I'm a conservative. I'm a Christian. And our people complain constantly that Hollywood and the media won't pay attention to the things we care about, the things we know are true. Well, finally, Angel Studios gives us a chance to put our money where our mouth is. So thank you all who have already pledged your support. And I hope more of you will, will do this because the story 
is urgently important, not because of what happened in the past, because we have to memorialize it. We do, but that's not the main reason. The main reason is to know what happened in the past so we can prevent it from happening in the future. And the future, y'all, is right now. I love that. Thanks, Rod, for that recap. And I wanted to, you know, earlier I was flipping through um, my copy, well, my partial copy of the Gulag Archipelago, which is actually about that that big. Let me see if I can fit in the screen. Um, and there was one part that I was, I thought I had underlined, which was um, to do evil, a human being must first of all believe that what he's doing is good or else that it is a well-considered act of conformity with natural law. And then he goes on to say, Shakespeare's evildoers stopped short at a dozen corpses because they had no ideology. Thanks to ideology, the 20th century was fated to experience evil doing on a scale calculated in the millions. And I think that was interesting to me because that is a lot of what this was. Well, what this series is about, Rod, what you kind of brought to my attention and in, in your study of Alexander Solzhenitsyn and a lot of these stories is it's normal people who participate in the rise of these, you know, these ideologies. It's normal people who get to the point where they are willing to rat on their friends, where they're willing to conform to these insane lies that these governments ask them, ask them to go along with because it's this gradual process, process that happens over time. And it's not villains out there. You know, granted, there are some very bad people, but it's us. It's all of us who need to right now stand up and draw a line in certain parts of our lives and, and things like that. Um, and so I think that's that's something that I've been thinking about a lot as we've been doing this and, and, and really becoming a, a big focus of this series, I think. Well, uh, just yesterday, I think it was in Scotland, the uh, the leader of Scotland, Hamza Yousaf, compared pro-life activists in Scotland to the Taliban, the Taliban who are a bunch of murderers. I mean, it's terrifying what's happening. In Great Britain now, we can see that Christians are being demonized. You are uh, in a position in, in Britain now, if you go pray silently in front of an abortion clinic, they can arrest you. That's against the law. Britain is farther along than the United States is, but you better believe we're on the same path. I mean, think, of, think about what Solzhenitsyn said about how people have to be convinced that the evil that they're about to do is actually good. Think what's happening in our country. We have a, an entire industry that is geared towards sexually mutilating young people, children and young adults, uh, cutting their breasts off, castrating them and so forth, chemically uh, mutilating them, all to change their gender. In some states in America, I believe there are six now, blue states, the state has the right to go in under law and take away children uh, age 15 to 18, minors still, from their parents if the parents will not agree to transition them, if the child says they want to be transitioned. Now, this is monstrous. This is something the Soviets didn't even do. And yet, we are told by the medical professionals who are doing this, we're told by the liberal politicians who are doing this, and we're told by the media and Hollywood that this is a good thing. We're liberating these young people to be their authentic selves. This is the sort of thing that the people who live through communism and who now live in Europe and America are seeing happen. And they're like, wait a minute, stop, please. Hold on here. Yeah. Don't you see what's happening? Yeah, no, it, it's so true. And and um, not to derail us, but at all, because this conversation is so important, it gets to the heart of it. Um, but for those of us, again, who are, I know last week people were joining throughout, so we just want to continue <clears throat> to re reset the table of what we're doing here. Angel.com slash live. Go find out more about the project. Express interest. Uh, we've got Isaiah Smallman, our director, Rod Dreher, the author of the book, Live Not By Lies. And really, Rod and Isaiah, you know, in thinking about why I wanted to do this project and thinking about uh, Solzhenitsyn and heroes like that of mine and, and of ours collectively, you know, so much, it, it's, I think, true wisdom in life and true analytical, uh, the ability to analyze culture, history, all these things, you have to constantly go you know, up at this higher level and then zoom back down to the personal, right? And so it's important. And that's that's why we want to do, if we're lucky enough, six episodes, multiple episodes of this, so that we have enough of that canvas to paint on that I mentioned earlier. But it's like, there's all the horrors of communism. There's all these big geopolitical forces. And for those of us here in America, even Rod, all the examples you're, you're giving, 
Um, it feels overwhelming at times. It feels like all this stuff is out of our control. But I also love the message of your book of Solzhenitsyn, of, of, of the good book, the Bible, where it's constantly bringing us back to remind us like, okay, you're unhappy with how things are in the world. The very first thing to do is look in the mirror. And what am I contributing to this? What lies am I living by? What lies am I um, either by omission or commission? Uh, uh, you know, uh, something's going on at work that I'm not comfortable with and I just keep going along with it, right? Whether that's in your personal relationships, your work, your job, or the nation at large. And so it's interesting, and I, Rod, if you want to speak on this in Isaiah too, but just maybe say a few words as well of how this comes back down to the individual. And ironically, the individual is the thing that totalitarian minded folks and systems care the least for, but that's really where this stuff can change for better or worse is in the individual human heart. Right. Well, I, I want to, before I, I answer that specifically, I want to lay the groundwork here for why uh, we can look back in history and see that the system we have in the U.S. today under our liberal free market democracy is setting the stage for totalitarianism. Now, this is something that we all look at. We're all a part of it. We live in the society. We all think that uh, everything's going great. But when I read the book by Hannah Arendt, uh, she was the foremost scholar of totalitarianism. She wrote a book in 1951 called The Origins of Totalitarianism, in which she went back to look at the Soviet example and the Nazi example to see how is it that people give themselves over to totalitarianism? I mean, it, it doesn't, it's not that it's entirely uh, uh, imposed from on high. Individual people have to give themselves over to this for it to take place. Now, Hannah Arendt found that there were a few signs that tell you that a society, any society, is susceptible to totalitarianism. And when I read it, I thought, oh my gosh, this is us. Uh, the main sign that she saw as a predictor was mass loneliness and atomization. She said a totalitarian regime is made up of a crowd of lonely individuals. When people feel disconnected from each other, from institutions, from families, and so forth, then they are vulnerable to someone coming in from on high in the state, or usually in the state, but some power coming in and saying, I can give you what you want. I can give you meaning, purpose, and solidarity and community. This is what happened in communist Russia, and this is what happened in Nazi Germany. Well, if you look at the statistics in America today, we are an immensely lonely, sad society. Just last week, it came out that the suicide rate is as high as it has been now since World War II. And the loneliest generation is not the elderly generation. The loneliest generation is the, are the Zoomers, uh, Generation Z, the ones who are supposedly so well connected. Anyway, loneliness and atomization is the number one predictor of totalitarianism, that it's coming. Another son, um, losing faith in hierarchies and institutions. When people no longer believe in things like the military, like the government institutions, when they don't believe in the media and academia and medicine and so on and so forth, then the society begins to fall apart and they op we open the door to, totali to totalitarianism. Now you can't force yourself to you can't force yourself to believe in something that um, that uh, uh, that is not trustworthy. But that's what's happening now. You look around you. Do you what do you believe in the institutions of our society? Uh, I'll be real quick here. They also believed that um, that uh, a sign of totalitarianism is coming is transgressing for the sake of transgressing. She, and people willing to believe in lies and ideologies that give them a sense of meaning, even if they know that they're not true, and so on and so forth. When you read Hannah Arendt's book, you know that we are in real trouble in America now. And that, when I read her book, that's what taught me that what these people who live through totalitarianism are saying is something we had better pay attention to. Yeah, it, Isaiah, I want you to... Uh chime in here as well. But even as you were talking, I thought, Rod, maybe we need to start a uh, Rod's book club, like on, on social media while we're making this thing, because there's so many important books. And I, and I was just jotting down uh, um, uh, hers because I've read some of her other works. But yeah, these, 
-hmm. like I was saying, Isaiah, if you want to comment on that at all, feel free, or, or we can jump to some other points. But just the, you know, the, the famous Solzhenitsyn line that you know, uh, uh, evil is runs through the human heart, not just through societies and, and those things, which is a great uh, quote. But I know you even brought up a great one you mentioned to me, Isaiah, uh, today from Dostoevsky, who's my favorite author, the guy that is. Uh, took history and made it come alive in this four or five dimensional way uh, as a novelist. And, and I think predicted all of this better than anyone else in, in history, that, that what was coming in his native Russia and, and really around the world with totalitarianism. But I don't know, any thoughts on the individual part of this and the looking in the mirror? And if you want to share that quote as part of your response too. Yeah, I'd love to jump in with that. I, I think <clears throat> Rod, I appreciate that kind of insight. And I think another aspect of it that has been striking me is that this is what happens when nihilism takes over and when meaning disappears. And how can we possibly value the rights of an individual when we, we don't, you know, have a framework for valuing anything? But yeah, there was a great quote from from um, from Dostoevsky that I, I was reminded of today, which is above all, don't lie to yourself. The man who lies to himself and listens to his own lie comes to a point that he cannot distinguish the truth within him or around him and so loses all respect for himself and for others and having no respect he ceases to love that says a lot to me about this whole progression you know it starts with me it works outward in this kind of fractal way and it's true on every level and i know that in my own life i i've had to recognize so many different ways that i've been lying and and sort of failing to take sort of Socrates's advice and know thyself, you know, that that's a, that's a painful process. And it's one that we all need to constantly engage in, or we might not even realize that we're lying, we might be taken advantage of, we might get swept up in these big movements and, and not even realize what's happening. And I think that's something that all of us need to be more aware of. Yeah, well said, Rod. I want to turn to you here in a second. I know you've got a, a couple of anecdotes uh, of folks that you've encountered along the way, and maybe we could hit upon one or two of those um, and save some for for future uh, live streams. I also want to say thank you to folks like Roberta uh, who who um, expressed interest. One hundred and fifty dollars. Thank you, Angel dot com slash live. Please go there, share it with your friends. Um, we need your continued support. We're over a million dollars of express interest as we shared earlier in the broadcast. So we thank you immensely for that. Um, but yeah, Rod, please, it, we've, we've got some photos, we've got some things, you've got some anecdotes, maybe pick yeah. one or two uh, of, the, of your favorite sure. ones and share who are these people that you've actually sat with? Yeah, well, what you're talking about individuals uh, make, make a difference. That's one of the big the, the one of the big things about my book about live not by lies and what we want to do with this documentary is go sit down and talk to brave heroic Christian individuals who stayed behind who didn't leave who stayed behind and resisted. Now I'm talking about people like Alexander Ogorodnikov. I think we have a, a photo of him. He uh, Alexander Ogorodnikov. There he is. Uh, was a young Russian Christian. Uh, it, he was born into a very prominent communist family, but he lost his faith in communism in the early 70s and became a Christian. Well, the Soviets put him uh, in jail for that, and they put him on death row. Not that he had a death sentence, but they wanted him to be in a place where, uh, where he would be bled out, basically. So he goes in there, and what does he do? He begins to evangelize. He began to convert prisoners to the gospel. And the Soviets got so mad at him, they put him in solitary confinement and they beat him there. You can, when I talked, met with him in Moscow, his face was partially paralyzed from the beatings he took. He told me that when he was in solitary confinement, he began to lose his faith. He began to wonder if God had abandoned him. And then one night he was awakened by an angel who showed him a very clear vision. In the vision, he saw a prisoner, a condemned prisoner, walking uh, with his hands handcuffed behind his back, escorted by two guards. He was being taken to be executed. Remember, this was death row. But he knew, Alexander did, that this prisoner was somehow going to heaven to be with Christ because he, Alexander, had witnessed to, them, to him. Over and over, this happened. And Alexander finally mm -hmm. came to understand what the Lord was doing here. He was showing him that because he, Alexander, had been in that prison, these condemned men who were going to their deaths, were going to be with the Lord that day in paradise. And that returned Alexander's faith to him and taught him that suffering has meaning. 
He gained everything back then and realized that God had used him for that purpose. This is a story I heard over and over and over again from these, these amazing people that suffering had meaning. They weren't afraid of suffering. They knew that they had to accept it for the glory of Jesus Christ in the circumstances they were in. And that's what gave them the strength to get through it. There's a, another story, the, the woman with the black and white photo, her, her name is Dorothy. Uh, you had it up there just a second ago. She's a Slovak Christian, uh, born in 1929. She uh, was thrown into prison by the communists for being a Christian, for going to church. She and her family suffered throughout the entire communist regime because they would not renounce Christ. Look at her face. Look at those eyes. That photo was taken by my friend Timo Kriska. He's a young Slovak photographer. We have a picture of him, too. He's got a young man with a beard. Uh, Timo set out in his country, Slovakia, to document these Christians who had gone, that's Timo, who had gone through the gulag, and who, but who came through with their faith intact. Timo had a grandfather who suffered this way, and he wanted to do him honor by, by photographing these elderly people and hearing their stories. Timo told me that these people were all luminous. He said, I realized as I listened to them that the more they, uh, the less power they had in when they were imprisoned, the stronger they became in Christ. And it affected Timo so strongly that he realized that even though he had been, he had grown up after the communism had fallen, that he himself had become a prisoner uh, of the tyranny of materialism, the tyranny of anxiety about status and all the things that had been taken away from these uh, these prisoners. And he converted more deeply himself. He said that they caused, uh, just being with these amazing men and women who had lost everything, caused Timo to turn away from his own selfishness and to realize, as Timo put it to me, suffering is the beginning of our redemption. How radical is that? How many? How often do any of us ever hear that in church? But that is precisely what got these men and women through persecution, through totalitarianism. I'll tell you another story, and I'll, I'll end with this one. Yuri Sipko, he was a, a Russian Baptist pastor. We have a picture of Yuri and me, white-haired guy, on the streets of Moscow after we finished our interview. Um, Yuri uh, was born in 1950, uh, and you know, which was, uh, there he is, um, which was in, during the time of Stalinism, the last years of Stalinism. His father was a Baptist pastor taken to prison by the Soviets. Uh, uh, men, all the pastors and, and lay leaders of their Baptist community were taken to prison. The women in his community kept it together, educated the kids, discipled the kids. Yuri told me that uh, looking at his father and mother, that gave him the strength to know what it meant to be a true Christian and to be willing to suffer for the Lord. Um, he told me too that small groups saved Christianity in Russia because when they couldn't go to church, when there were no churches, when they didn't even couldn't even get Bibles, it was in small groups that they came together to worship, to teach, and they would copy out scripture by hand to keep the faith alive. He also told me standing right there on that street in Moscow to go back to America and tell the American church that if you are not willing to die for Jesus Christ, then your faith is nothing but psychological comfort. Now, can you imagine that? You see how nice it was. The street was just off of Red Square. I had just been so touched and, and uh, inspired by his testimony. And this man takes me, puts his hands on my shoulders and tells me, go home and tell the American church to get ready. And uh, this is the kind of story. We want to get Yuri on camera uh, while he's still alive and Alexander Ogorodnikov. Men and women like that, like, like Dorothy, the, the Slovak woman, to tell their stories so we can not only think, oh, what a great story, what a great witness, but we can take their witness into our hearts and change our own lives so we can be ready if the worst comes to us. Wow. That's, yeah. That's, I mean, every time powerful. I hear those stories, it just completely blows me away. And I think part of what's so interesting about this is the power of storytelling. And I, I you know, I'm, I'm to mention Alexander Solzhenitsyn again, I think part of what made him so such a dangerous weapon really against um, the Soviet Union was that he was such an effective storyteller and he did so much groundwork to discover and uncover the stories that had been pushed under the rug. And that was a huge part 
of what eventually led not only people outside of the Soviet Union, but even inside of it. It seems like to recognize, oh, this is not just, yeah, like to, to start to see through the facade and, and for all of it to actually fall down. I mean, that's the, it's an incredible weapon. And that's why speech is so important, obviously. Um, and of course, that's one of the first things that goes. We get afraid to say what we really think because people in power know that that's the way that these things change. But RJ, you were going to touch on something. No, I was just going to say, you know, the, the, the resistance, these stories of suffering and resistance and, and fortitude in the face of things that we can't imagine and Lord willing won't have to fully face in the same way as Rod points out, you know, the totalitarianism, the instinct here in the West feels and looks different, but who knows where it goes. But the resistance starts back in that the individual, the human heart, our soul, uh, the way that we treat others, the things we say, are we telling lies to ourselves and those around us? And and really starts with the family and 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 what more what has been attacked more in, in our country um in recent years than that that idea of family and that the sovereign and that is an institution and that is something uh god ordained i would even say of course uh, for those of us of faith um and parents you don't have to be a parent all of us on here are parents and we care deeply for our our, our children and our families and those around us. But it's like, yeah, if we aren't doing these things in, in, in our own lives, in our own homes, uh, <laughs> with our relatives, with our neighbors, uh, uh, there is no hope. If we can't start it in the individual, familial, communal church level, if we're not prepared there, which is Rod, which I love. Uh, and let's, I wanna throw out real quick before Rod, I'll, I'll give you the closing thought before we go to Q and A. Um, and we'll get into some other things before we close out. but the stories of preparing people and thinking, and that's part of what we want this, this doc series, this documentary series, multiple episodes to tell the story of, you know, the subtitle of your book, you know, which is a manual for Christian dissidents. Like this was written with people of faith in mind of how do you prepare yourself in a world that is crumbling and changing uh, quicker than you know what to do with. And the stories you tell of people that, that went and built these communities. I don't know if you want to say something about that quickly before we yeah, get to yeah. Q&A. Yeah, I do. Um, I dedicated the book, as we talked about in last week's live stream, to the memory of a Catholic priest named Father Tomislav Kolakovic. Father Kolakovic uh, is a Croatian who escaped the Nazis. They were coming after him for doing work against the Nazis in his native Zagreb. He went to hide in Bratislava in Slovakia and began teaching in the Catholic school there, Catholic college. And he told his students that the good news is the Germans are going to lose this war. The bad news is the Soviets are going to be running this country when it's over. And the first thing they're going to do is come after the church. We got to be ready. So what Father Kolakovich did was put together groups, mostly of young people, uh, who had come together for prayer, for study, and for discussion, not just uh, discussion for the sake of discussion, but they would talk about what should we do? How can we prepare ourselves for what we think might be coming and build an underground network? Within two years, a, a network had spread all over that country, despite the fact that some of the Catholic bishops uh, chastised Father Kolakovic and said, Father, yeah, come on, it's not going to happen here. God's going to take care of things. Um, we're going to be fine. Quit scaring people. But Father Kolakovic knew how totalitarianism worked because he had studied in seminary to be a missionary to the Soviet Union. So he kept up his preparation. Sure enough, as soon as the Iron Curtain fell, everything happened just like he said it would. But the underground church in, in his country, in Slovakia, was strong because he and a, a remnant of people had believed Father Kolakovic and they had prepared themselves. One of the people who was his top lieutenant, he wasn't an ordained uh, minister, but he was a young, uh, a young physician, Sylvester Kirchmeri. Um, I talk about him in the book and about his exercises that he did long before he uh, going to prison was even a thought. He began to memorize scripture because he knew that if it all came down, if there was totalitarianism in this country, they weren't going to give him a Bible in prison. So when they pulled him off the street and threw him in prison where he stayed for 10 years, he already had so much scripture committed to memory. This is one of the things we have got to do right now, not five years from now, not 10 years from now, right now. We all hope to God that it will never happen in America, but with the signs, uh, 
flashing now, the red lights flashing saying danger, danger, danger. We have got to pay attention to what people like Dr. Kirchmary said and act. Absolutely. Uh, and I think that's a well, combination of telling those older stories and then also, again, tying those to what we're looking at right now. And I think, you know, Angel obviously has been doing that in incredible ways. And I think Sound of Freedom is, you know, such a great um, example of the power of storytelling and the, the hunger that people really have to see honest, um, you know, compelling storytelling that deals with this, uh, these issues that are being completely ignored by the mainstream media. And in, in fact, totally suppressed actively. I mean, some of the coverage of Sound of Freedom was completely bonkers to me. I was reading these articles and I was like, this must be a joke because it's so over the top um, inflammatory garbage that uh, it just makes absolutely no sense that anyone could, with any self-respect, could write this. But I think it does show just where we're at right now as a society that people accept this and are willing to say it. Yeah, it is. It's, you know, whether it's in an individual relationship, a friendship, a work relationship, or, or something as big as the media and all these, again, sort of geopolitical forces, just be wary of anybody who's lying to your face. And, and especially when you know it, sometimes it's hard to know if someone's lying, right? There's certain things I don't understand. I'm not smart enough to understand everything about the economy and everything anybody, you know, Janet Yellen or whoever Trump's, you know, treasuries. I, I, I don't know enough about a lot of that and I should. But when there are things in someone saying sound of freedom is a QAnon, a J, you know, all this stuff, you're like, just be wary of anyone in your life that's just lying to your face like that. And uh, God bless. Yeah. Angel and all those. Oh, that, there, that, that, probably is... some of you. Sorry, go ahead, Rob. Yep. I was going to say, th 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 this is the media today. I uh, interviewed uh, not long ago a young man from South Africa, uh, Afrikaner, who is studying here in Europe. And he was telling me about what's going on in his country, about the murders of white farmers by some of the, uh, of the militants in that country. And it's a race war is underway at a low level in South Africa. But this is not being talked about in the media. And I, I noticed just last week the New York Times did a story about um, – a large group of Marxist Leninists led by uh, former black freedom fighter, Julius Malema, chanting a stadium full of people chanting, kill the boar, kill the farmer. The it, terrifying stuff, totally racial, totally like Rwanda genocide stuff. The New York Times the next day or two days later ran a story saying, it's no big deal. He didn't really mean it. And I, I was absolutely shocked because most Americans not knowing anything else other than what the New York Times tells them will think, no problem. This is just right wing people, probably racist themselves, getting upset about nothing. This sort of thing happens over and over, whether it's about COVID, whether it's about political prosecutions. I live here in Hungary, uh, where wh a country that is routinely slandered. It's a Christian country, but routinely slandered in the American and Western European media for being backwards and fascist. When if you come here and you all will, if we do the movie, you'll see like what? This is a great place. Everything's peaceful. Everything's normal. It feels like an American city, Budapest, in 1995. But this is what, when you actually live in reality and see how the media lie, and they lie with an ideological agenda, you begin to realize what these people who live through communism are talking about and why it is so utterly important that we make this movie and get the message out. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So totally. we want it. It's so, so well said. We want to get to some questions. If you're still... With us here, please, uh, those of you on Facebook Live and watching on other uh, platforms, thank you for joining us. Uh, please submit questions. We'll take a few here as we wrap things up and uh, and get you on your way. And I have a couple of questions too. Um, but yes, angel.com slash live, express interest, share it with your friends. Um, okay, and then also we, we've, we've, we did a better job of this last week, but as people's names were popping up, Thank you, Rhonda, others that we saw. Thank you so much for expressing interest as we've been going. We, we really, really do appreciate it. So we have a question from Southern Mama. Why do people not talk? And if I can infer what she's saying, you know, what, what is it that keeps us from not speaking out and, and, and standing up to some of these things we're seeing? Yeah, well, I'd love fear. to jump in on that really and, and quick. Even, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'm just going to say it's fear uh, and, and it's justified fear because we see people all the time losing their jobs, being harassed on social media, sometimes harassed in on the street 
for taking dissident positions. And uh, all they have, to, they, all they, the mob has to do, all the woke mob has to do is destroy one and you teach a hundred or you teach a thousand to be quiet. Um, that's why those of us, and I count myself as one of them, I've got a pretty high profile. It's hard to cancel me, uh, given all the things I've said and, and where I work and what I do for a living. I feel that I have a responsibility to exercise my free speech uh, on behalf of people who are uh, less able to do so because they have a genuine uh, and justified fear of losing their job. Ultimately, though, we're not going to be able to live by fear. At some point, every single one of us is going to know that there is a line that we cannot cross. And if you're not thinking about it right now, what that line is, you better start doing it because the the other side, the totalitarians are going to push you, push you and push you until um, until you're either going to have to fight back or you'll totally submit. Yeah, there, I, I was listening to an interesting discussion about the way Ireland is handling this. And, and there's a lot of places that are beginning to classify hate speech in these very nuanced, not, well, not nuanced, actually, these big blanket, you know, undefined yeah. ways where, where it's now criminalized to say something that offends somebody else. And it's like, this is not going to end well. And, and it's, you know, it's easy to say, oh, okay, you know, it's not going to end well way, way, way down the line. But we see how quickly these things change. I mean, even just a couple of years ago, um, that all of this felt very different than it does even now. And I think that's part of the reason this book was so um, important is because it, it, it led into this. And, and I think we're a lot of people, myself included, even as I came to this project, are becoming more and more aware of how this isn't some future problem. This is a problem today. No. Um, yeah, we've got a couple more yeah. questions. No, I, oh, I ahead, just want Rod. to say real quick, have, have you heard of debanking? I know that you guys might have, but our listeners, our viewers need to know that there's a practice now called debanking in which banks uh, close the bank accounts of people who are their customers they consider to be problematic, which is to say customers that hold opinions and speak out on them that the bank doesn't agree with. Nigel Farage, a politician in Britain, was debanked by his, even though he's a major politician, he was debanked by his British bank because they don't like his politics. The debanking thing was used in the past to get rid of organized crime, but now the banks, and it's perfectly legal, are doing it to ordinary citizens who dissent from woke ideology. And this is happening right now. Canadian truckers, anybody? Yep. Trudeau yep. and the uh, our friendly neighbors to the north. Um, all right, so yeah, th this is ah man, we got to make we have, we got to make this series, uh, folks. Angel.com slash live. Please go continue to express your interests. Um, we got a couple other questions we want to get to um, in terms of our filming process. Who we're going to be speaking to. Uh, and, and Isaiah, you can take this one. <clears throat> Will you be filming experts in the U.S. and overseas? Where, where do we plan to go? Where do we want to go, ideally, in, in speaking to folks? Absolutely. So, yeah, we're, we're really casting a wide net, I think, of um, people who can talk to all of these different topics, again, historical and contemporary, with a deep level of expertise and or personal experience and so we're like rod said we're going to be going to budapest we're going to be going hopefully to lots of other places unfortunately um we won't be able to go to russia but we are excited to go and again gather a lot of these important firsthand stories of people who live through this and um can speak to their own experience but yeah we're excited to talk to all sorts of experts who know about this from a policy standpoint for instance or from you know a, a medical standpoint or from you know whatever the an economical you know whatever there are different people and and some of the best people you know around who are extremely influential are fans abroad and you know, we're, we're excited to, to be talking to people everywhere we can. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, Jordan Peterson has already committed personally to me to be here. You know, he knows a lot about totalitarianism and he totally believes in this project. Um, but it, we're also, as you say, going to go to talk to some of these actual people. Please, God, they'll be alive. We'll get the money to do this. We can get them on camera while they're still alive because once they're gone, they're gone. They've gone into history, but they're still here and we've got to talk to them uh, about Russia. I don't know if I mentioned this to you all, but I, I was talking to a Russian friend and said that, you know, I think it's too dangerous for us to go to Russia. 
And he said, there's a probably a way to fly Alexander Ogorodnikov, Yuri Sipko, and anybody else we want to talk to, probably fly them to a neutral third country and sit there and talk to them. Uh, I hope we can do that. I hope that we get the wow. kind of support from our viewers that will enable us to do that because, uh, you know, they're facing a situation right now in Russia that is uh, uncomfortably like what they thought was all in the past. Excellent. All right, let's get to a couple other questions here and, and we'll wrap up. Um, create Another creative question, Isaiah, for you. Um, how do you envision... You know, as we hear these compelling stories, obviously we don't have footage of these things. You know, it is a documentary, but some of this stuff, they're anecdotes, people telling us about things like uh, the angel that visited uh, uh, Rod's friend in prison. Uh, how, do, how do we capture that? How, how will you be approaching that? Animation, recreations, things like that. What, what, what do you see? What excites you creatively? Absolutely. We're, you know, again, that's one of the things that we're in the process of identifying different opportunities for. Um, obviously, the goal is to gather as much original material as we possibly can. But yeah, we're really excited about getting super creative to bring these stories to life in a very visual way that makes this very real for all of us and, um, and, and walks that line of uh, cinematic and real and grounded and poetic and kind of all of these different things all rolled up into one. And so we're, we're really going to be pulling out all the stops to make sure that this story feels cohesive and interesting and accessible. And um, if I can jump in, we can still go to some of these places. I mean, we have some footage already. We can get some of our own about an underground hidden chamber in Bratislava in Slovakia, where for 10 years, the underground church there uh, printed Sam's dot. Prayer, uh, secret illegal prayer books, hymn books, Sunday school uh, material. The underground Catholic, th there we are. There we are going into the underground basement. The man there go, leading me down there is a historian of the underground church. We went into this tunnel um, and you come up inside this hidden chamber uh, and they had it rigged so if the secret police were coming, they could pull a lever and it would flood with sewage. So they, the, the, the secret police would think, oh, there's nothing really going on here. But uh, in that little room, the Catholic underground church using an offset printer that was delivered to them, smuggled in by their evangelical friends at the Open Doors Project in the Netherlands, Brother Andrew's project. There's the offset printer on the right. Um, these evangelical brothers brought in that thing so the, so the Catholics could have prayer books. I mean, it's incredible. I'm getting chills just thinking about it now. It all happened in that little room. We can go there. We can take our viewers into that room with the people who read the very prayer books that were printed there. And that was a lifeline to the Lord for them during uh, 10 years, the last 10 years of communism. Not not to make light of it, but Rod, you look like you were in like a Scooby-Doo caper there going into the uh, <laughs> hidden chamber to find that. The hidden treasure that's under the house, but no, it's it's it does give me goosebumps, and I know I just made a joke about it, but it really is powerful stuff in the imagery that we want to capture. But yeah, everything's on the table. Animation. Uh, my five-year-old daughter Maddie said she draws pictures of Bluey, the cartoon character. If we need that, so that's on the table as well. Um, but no, we we have everything at our access, and we want to go over, and that's why we're raising. Uh, we want to raise a, a significant budget, something that's, that we can actually use to go over to these places, spend the time, capture these stories, and uh, and do it do it justice. Let's get to our final question, and then we'll say our goodbyes, and um, we'll be back hopefully uh, another time soon. Um, is, well, we have a couple other questions, but I, I kind of want to end a little bit more on a personal note, and um, I know this is uh, it's going to feel a little bit like. Uh, uh, the end of a Bible study or, or prayer service or something, but like these are heady, weighty subjects and we're dealing with serious subject matter, even though, as we talked about last time, and hopefully folks can tell, we really all like each other. We have fun. We, we crack jokes. We love to eat good food and have, you know, there, there is some levity that's brought to it, but it is a serious topic. And um, we touched upon it last week, you know, the idea of spiritual warfare and all that stuff. But if Starting with Rod and then I say out just um, uh, without being too presumptuous, what are things that folks who care about this story, who have already expressed support that may end up actually committing funds through the crowdfunding, if, if we're lucky enough to do that, 
what can folks be praying about for you, for the story, for this project? What what's some of the things that you're thinking about spiritually and some of the attacks and other things that, that come in covering a story of, of this magnitude? Rod, well, sorry, I, starting I, with you. From, okay, yeah, well, from, from my perspective, we have to expect attacks. We have to expect that there will be all kinds of scurrilous political attacks on this project from people who don't want to see it made, who don't want this information out there, who want to make fun of it and, to, and try to tell people as the unbelieving bishops told uh, Father Kolakovic, oh, come on, nothing's going to happen here. And I think a lot of these attacks are going to come from inside the church, from pastors and lay leaders who don't want to be made uncomfortable by it because it's going to make a lot of them uncomfortable. Um, I would say, though, too, that that we need people we to pray and we need to pray ourselves to keep our spirits up um, and to keep focused on hope, because this is heavy stuff. When you read some of the things they did, especially in the Romanian gulag, things like they, they forced priests to have mock uh, uh, masses using dung, using uh, as uh, for the bread of for the body of Christ. I mean, it was totally satanic. When you when you immerse yourself in that, you you come up for air and you need to breathe sweet, clean air. We have to remember that we're doing this for the Lord. Uh, I, I think I'll and I'll end on this. I think about Dr. Sylvester Kirchmeri. I mentioned him earlier. Uh, he said in a manual he wrote after communism ended about how he survived 10 years in the gulag. He said that even before they arrested him, he always told himself and he taught himself to believe that there is nothing that can make make him happier than to suffer for his Lord Jesus Christ. And so on, when the day came uh, that the secret police pulled over and dragged him off, the, there he is, Dr. Kirchmeri. What a glorious man. What a happy man. He died in 2013. But when the secret police pulled him off the street and into the car to take him to prison he burst out laughing and they said what are you laughing what's wrong with you and he said you've just made my day you're giving me the opportunity to bear witness to my lord thank you for that i mean that's that sounds insane but that's what we need and i hope that we can bring that spirit to this project to help um our our viewers know that we may all have to suffer uh that is what it means to be a christian that is what it has always meant to be a christian but the real hope there is that our suffering has meaning now as timo kriska the young slovak filmmaker said when he went to see all of these old people who had been impoverished by their suffering uh for the for the lord in prison he said that they had the peace that passeth all understanding you could not take it away from them and it was not in spite of their suffering but it was because of their suffering for jesus beautifully said uh, isaiah close us out here and i'll, I'll say a final goodbye but you know, you've got a young family, travel, like what, what's on your mind as we think about actually going out to make this project? Yeah, I'd say clarity of mind, discernment, you know, um, there's a lot of different things that we need to uh, be very um, wise about, I would say. And I would, I would appreciate if everybody would just continue to pray for that. You know, I, I, we want to make something that's um, going to make this world better to be uh very to put it very simply and yeah i would just say for all of us i i mean i hear these stories of people you know who who laugh while being carried off to prison and i think i don't know if that i, I don't know if i'm there yet like i want to be but if i'm honest that's just that sounds impossible so i think courage is something that all of us can pray for because i you know i worry about this project and what it's going to do to my career and i'm like it's can't be that bad you know and yet it still keeps me up a little bit and so um i think courage is something that all of us should be praying for constantly because i i think it, it is going to be necessary and um and 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 that's again that's a that's something that's so exciting about this is i want to see these people firsthand i want to see these stories on camera because i need those moments of inspiration i need to be steeled and 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 bolstered by their courage because again storytelling is the way that we can can spread that yeah, no, it's beautifully said. I, I, I will end uh, tonight with my favorite quote that I think about often when we work on like this, and it's from G.K. Chesterton, who said, true soldier fights not because he hates what's in front of him, but because he loves what he's defending, what's behind him. 
And uh, that mindset, if we can keep that spirit uh, in our hearts and in, in the forefront of our minds, I think is the right approach here. But guys, thank you so much. This was a blast. We're going to do it again. We'll be announcing when, and there'll be more to come uh, in the weeks to come. But angel.com slash live. Tell your friends, share it around, uh, reach out to us uh, at social media. Rod, say, quick, give quick plugs. Twitter, where can people find you? Yeah, I'm on uh, Twitter, X at, uh, at Rod Dreer. X. I have a subs I have a paid Substack, um, uh, rodreer.substack.com. And I also am writing now for the European Conservative at europeanconservative.com. Zay. Awesome. Yeah, I'm just at Zay Smallman at that's on Twitter and Instagram for that matter. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you guys for tuning in. We'll be back again soon. Tell your friends. God bless. Already people are beginning to forget about communism. They're beginning to forget about the victims of communism, which now number we know about 100 million. I mean, there was no freedom. There was no freedom of speech, no freedom of religion, no freedom of thought. People couldn't write a poem or a play or, or a story or conduct a scientific experiment without some censor first approving it. All of that story has to be told. Back in 2014, I got a phone call from a physician at the Mayo Clinic who reached out and said, I need to tell a journalist what just happened. He told me that his elderly mother, who lives with him and his wife, had been raised in Czechoslovakia. When communism came to power there after the Second World War, the government told her to quit going to church. She said, I'm not going to quit going to church. They threw her in prison for four years and tortured her as a so-called Vatican spy. She immigrated to America, started her life here. Now she was telling her son, son, the things I see happening in America today remind me of what was happening in my own country when communism came. Well, what was the old lady seeing? She's seeing the effects of cancel culture. She was seeing people facing the loss of job and the loss of their livelihood for getting on the wrong side of the politically correct. People being afraid to speak their minds for fear of losing their job or being hounded out of polite society. So over the next few years, if I would meet someone who had grown up under Soviet communism but came to America, I would put the question to them. Are the things you're seeing happen in our country today in any way reminiscent of what you left behind? Every single one of them said yes. In a new book, my next guest suggests that we may be heading down a dangerous path toward totalitarianism. Live Not By Lies. A remarkable new book entitled Live Not By Lies. 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 Inspired not least by the great Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I got the title for the book from an essay by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. The Soviets exiled him from the country. They kicked him out in 1974. Just before he was kicked out, he sent a short essay to all of his followers. The name of the essay was Live Not By Lies, because the whole communist system was built on lies, lies about human nature, lies about the way the world is, and it can only be sustained when people are afraid to live in truth. Everybody in the Soviet system lied about everything to everyone all the time. And so the whole system was set up and maintained because everyone lied. There are so many people among the intel intelligentsia especially who are absolutely immune to facts. It's as, as, if, they, it's as if they took their uh, anti-fact shots uh, every, every, every year, and uh, the facts will just not affect it. They shut down schools over COVID and then stole a bunch of pandemic relief for themselves. I know that they're lying to me. I know that they're lying to, to, to the nation. We have to say that men can have babies, that men can be women and women can be men. Totalitarian governments try to take away cultural memory, which is to say the memory of a people that tells them who they are. We've seen this happen in our own country with statues taken down, where history suddenly becomes extremely contentious. One of the things that disturbs me tremendously is about this enthusiasm for socialism at a time when people are literally starving in Venezuela, an oil-rich country. Yesterday I asked ChatGPT, are there any similarities between today's woke revolution and Chairman Mao's cultural revolution of the 1960s? And it wrote back, how long do you have? 
People don't take it seriously because they think of totalitarianism and what comes to mind is George Orwell. What comes to mind is Stalin, secret police, gulags, firing squads, things like that. That's not what we're dealing with yet, at least. In China, they have what's called a social credit system under which the Chinese government controls every Chinese citizen. It has the computer power to track everybody's movements all throughout the day. If you meet with people the government considers to be antisocial, that is to say Christians or dissidents, that is noted by the system and you get automatically a lower social credit rating. Eventually, if you get a low enough social credit rating, you can't buy or sell or participate in the economy. Now that should send chills down the spine of every Christian who knows his or her Bible. Alexander Solzhenitsyn said that the line between good and evil does not pass between social classes or between you know, races or anything else. The line between good and evil passes right down the middle of every human heart. I remember standing on a street corner in Moscow talking to a white-haired elderly Russian Baptist pastor, a man whose father and the fathers of all the men in his community when they were little were taken away by Stalin and sent to Siberia. He said, go back to America and tell the church, if you're not prepared to suffer for your faith, then your faith is worthless. Well, what did he mean by that? through every generation of Christianity, even today in countries like Egypt, in the Muslim world, and in China, Christians are suffering for their faith. It is vital that we get this eyewitness testimony on camera so people in our country will not forget history, that they'll know history and they'll learn from history so that we can build the resistance now while we still have the freedom to do so. Eventually, this whole system of lies will fall apart but it will take longer for it to fall apart if people are afraid to stand up for the truth, if people are afraid to have the courage to resist, to say, you do to me whatever you can, I will not live by lies.